My name is Brandon, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Brandon. Um, from a very young age and through much of college, I would have never thought I would say that out loud. Alcohol is always a part of my family. Cookout, cookouts, fish fries, holidays, most everyone in my family enjoyed a cold beer or two. My older cousin even had what I thought was a secret collection full of full beer cans in the back of his closet. It was behind all of his clothes, and I thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. It seemed like there were hundreds of them. Um, and all, and for all but my immediate family, alcohol wasn't really a problem. My daddy, however, was an alcoholic. Through most of his life, he was this happy sort of drunk, life of the party, loud and boisterous. And that went on um, really until I was about 15, um, probably 14 or 15. Um, I had a pretty close family growing up. I had a twin sister, um, and it was just us and my parents, but we lived in a very, very small town, population, I think it's like 79. Um, moved to a town of 346, and um, but around all of my family, grandparents, um, aunts, uncles, cousins, so very close family. We were at someone's house every weekend. Um, when I was 15, well, I guess when I was 14, actually, my mother became sick and was diagnosed pretty quickly with colon cancer and passed away even more quickly. Um, as I look back, I'm, I'm thankful that she didn't suffer as so many people do in that illness. But it was very quick, and my dad suffered along with her and his alcoholism. Um, <coughs> just became, um, it went to a new level. And so he was not so much the life of the party anymore. I saw, I began to see the darker side of alcoholism. Um, and while I was only 14, my sister and I, I really felt the need to kind of step up um, in our family. Um, he was still working, so we were going to school in the, the town where we'd grown up, a small town, um, and then we moved to the bigger town, so we were driving, uh, or my sister was driving, but he would work, he would come home, he would drink. Um, and so it was it was a little bit of a mess, and I wanted no part of it. I went through junior high, high school, and had no interest in alcohol. And don't really remember there being that much around when I was in, in school, I'm sure it was there. Um, I do remember at my family farm, Someone had been at the creek um, hanging out and they got their truck stuck and just left and there was a cooler full of all, I mean, all I remember was like a couple passion, but there was all kinds of stuff. And all my cousins were like, oh, this is so exciting, let's, you know, whatever. And I was like, this is wrong, this is wrong. And if any of you drink this, I'll be telling your parents. <laughs> so I just, I just knew that if I took a drink, um, that one drink would turn me, and, and I didn't know what drink that would be. So, high school, normal. Um, I loved high school. I did really well in high school. Um, and then I came here to go to college, and still, no alcohol. I was super involved in church. Um, I was super involved on campus with BSU, and just the people I was around did not drink. Or if they did, I didn't know about it. Um, but it just wasn't what I, what I really um, had in mind. Um, and that went on, I mean, I don't remember the exact age I started drinking. Um, it was just friends changed and those friends drank and I began to see it not as just this horrible thing, I guess. Um, in my mind, I was seeing maybe people who could have a drink at dinner or a drink at a party would be fine. So, that's kind of where it started for me, just socially, um, with friends, um, at dinner, at people's houses, um, wedding receptions. Um, and I guess, um, I still don't know exactly when, but I, I found the one drink that hooked me. And um, that probably lasted 25 years of drinking, um, pretty much daily. Um, like I said, most of my friends drank. There were drinks after work. I lived and still do downtown. So living downtown and working downtown, spending a lot of time downtown where there's lots of activity. Um, 
provided lots of opportunities for happy hour, um, and my friends and I were regulars, and I really, really liked that. I liked the idea that I could walk into most of the places downtown, and they would recognize me. Some of them would have my drink ready when I sat down, and that was just a really neat feeling to me. Um, I know that I was well liked in high school and in college, and I had lots of friends, but somehow I still struggled a little bit with whether people liked me, um, and so that just kind of reinforced. And then the drinking also reinforced that. Just it, it allowed me to kind of take a deep breath and be who I thought I was, and it, that was a really good case. Um, so. Um, I began to see this lifestyle downtown as just an extension of my friend group, even though um, I really only saw these people when I was spending money on vodka with them. Um, but it just became part of my everyday routine. Um, and I was very active socially with um, parties and fundraising, things like that. And if I knew there wouldn't be alcohol, or even had a thought there wouldn't be alcohol, if we were going to a football game and we were going to get there late, there might not be enough time to tailgate, then we would pregame before we went to the event, or we would have something in the car. I just couldn't see having a good time somewhere where there wasn't going to be plenty for me to drink. Um, and, foolishly, I drove home pretty much every time. Um, I didn't like to ask for help. I still don't like to ask for help, but I've gotten better at it. Um, and I was always fine. I had a friend who would say, any question she asked, I would say, I'm fine. And then she would take a drink of what I was drinking. And she was like, oh my gosh, you're not, there's no way you're fine. Um, but I didn't want to have to ask someone to take me home, figure out how to get my car in the next morning. And it was just easier, in my mind, to roll the dice and drive home. Um, I had that. And by the grace of God, I had it, in so much as I didn't hurt anyone else or hurt myself. But I did um, get arrested for DWI. Um, this was probably, I tried to look at a timeline, or tried to figure out a timeline, and I'm just so terrible with, with time now, but I think around 2011, I do remember specifically being at a friend's house watching um, the Cardinals play baseball, and I could care less about baseball. <laughs> don't have any, and now I really don't like the Cardinals. <laughs> so we were there drinking, um, and I, when I drink anything, if I drink water, if I drink tea, if I drink Coke, at the time if I drink vodka, I gulp everything, and it's gone quickly. So I thought it would be smarter, and people wouldn't catch on if I drink out of... Um, it used to be, now it's getting, but it used to be Turvis tumblers. So I'd have a big old Turvis tumbler of vodka and whatever, and I'd drink that, and maybe no one knew how much I was drinking. Um, so I would make my drinks, and it got late, and it was time to leave, and I was dog sitting across town, so I, I leave, and I make it to go have uh, uh, vodka and Sprite to take with me for the road, because I mean, I was going five miles. <laughs> and on Southwest Drive, my phone made a noise and I thought maybe I had a text message. So I thought it would be safer to pull over and look at the phone and not try to look at it while driving. But I didn't realize I had pulled into a parking lot that was posted not a through street. And so I'm looking at my phone and then in the lights behind, or in the mirror behind me, I can see that a police car just pulled up. And um, I didn't even hear it. I mean, he didn't have his siren on or anything. He just pulled up, and I was like, oh. Huh. And I had the full tumbler of vodka in the cup holder. And I thought, okay, what do I need? So he's walking up, and I just dump it in the floorboard. <laughs> thinking, oh, okay, well, it's not, it's not full now, so this is, this is good. Um, <laughs> So, um, he rolled down the window, and I can only imagine what the smell was when he rolled down the window. And he asked if I had been drinking, and I said, well, I've probably had one or two. And I was, you know, I was here, and I'm going here to the dog city, and he asked me to get out of the car. And in my mind still, I'm like, you're fine, you've got this, you've seen this on TV, 
it'll be easy. Um, and I did the field sobriety test, and he put me in the back of the car. He said, we're going downtown. And I immediately burst into tears in the car because now I'm in a position that I'm probably going to have to ask for help. It's 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning. Who am I going to call for help? Um, so he makes some small talk as, I'm, as we're driving, and I'm just, I mean, I'm just crying. I'm thinking, I'm going to have to spend the night in jail. How am I going to spend the night in jail? I don't know how that would have gone. Um, so we get to the police station, and they, they never take my phone. And so I just start psycho-texting a friend of mine. I'm going to call you, hopefully, answer the phone. And they let me call a friend, and she answers. I don't have to spend the night in jail. Um, I didn't get, like a, I guess since I didn't spend the night in jail, I didn't get a mug shot. And I went home with her. Well, actually, she took me to the house where I was dog sitting first because I had to check on them. The dogs had pooped everywhere. <laughs> so I'm in the floor, cleaning that up, crying, get that cleaned up, get them settled, and go sleep. And I have to let work know the next day that it's probably not, I'm probably not going to be at work. And I'll never forget when I called to let uh, my manager know that I was going to be there, what had happened. Um, he said uh, it was only a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ah, yikes, that, that kind of hurt. Um, so, um, I did all the stuff with the DWI. Um, I, but it didn't happen quickly. I kept thinking it happened in October, and I'm thinking I don't. I have, still haven't told anyone other than the people at work knew and the person who picked me up from the jail. So I'm thinking I have all these friends who are attorneys. Don't want to tell anyone. I don't want to be in the paper. I just want to go to court when it's time. Get get that over with, and then um, do whatever I have to do next. And then it hit the paper before, well, actually my attorney, I did get an attorney, because um, I had friends who used him, and, and he was a good friend. And at the time, I wore glasses, but they were fake glasses. They didn't have anything in them. And my driver's license did not have the glasses in the picture, and he said, did they ask you about your glasses? And he, I said, oh, well, they're fake. And he was like, oh, okay. But, um, and he said, and I said, but what about the sobriety test? And he said, you didn't do so well on that. So he kind of keeps it out of out of the court for a little while. And then a friend, a very very good friend, called and she had seen it. And she said, why didn't you? Why didn't you call me? Why didn't you reach out? And I said, because I was mortified. I just didn't want anyone to know. And so another friend somehow, I still don't know how she found out about court, and she said, you're not doing that alone. And so she went with me to court. So I did, I did all the things with the DWI, the, the class, the panel, paid my fines, which I think they had me figure out in the class, and I think that one drink cost about $4,000, probably more. Um, and then I had to have the breathalyzer in my car. Um, for you, you have to have it a certain amount of time, but I was too embarrassed and stubborn to ask off time for work to do the class in a timely amount of time. So I had it probably three or four months longer than you have to have it, and just paid all that because I didn't want to ask for help. Um, and I, looking back, I've said to, I, you would think I would have learned a lesson there, and that would have been the end of it. Um, but it wasn't, um, and I continued to drink. I would, you know, other people would drive, obviously, because I didn't want anyone to know that I had that in the car. And if you've not had one, it's a very, very humbling experience because it happens at the most inopportune moments as you're driving, and you have to ideally you pull over and deal with it. But it's so embarrassing for me. It was. I tried to do anyway. It's just it was. I thought that was as low as I could get, and I still didn't learn. Um, so my drinking after that point, after dealing with the DWI, um, like I said, it didn't it didn't stop. I, I continued to drink. Um, 
it, it didn't really affect my work um, that I could see in my mind. So I just, just kind of status quo. I still worked. I still went to parties. I still did everything I had been doing. Um, but I was beginning to do that more alone. Um, it was just easier to um, be by myself. And years ago, I hadn't thought about this until I was thinking about tonight. I, um, a friend had asked, and this was years ago, so I guess this is starting way longer than I had even thought. But someone said, well, why are, you seem to be drinking alone a lot. Why are you drinking alone? And I just brushed off and said, well, if I drink alone, then I'm the funniest, smartest, and most handsome person in the room. <laughs> and just laughed about it. But in the back of my mind, that still, that joke would still kind of, um, kind of rear its head. And so I would think, yeah, you know, you're not hurting anyone if you're just drinking by yourself. So they can do what they want to do, and you can do what you want to do. Um, and then another lie that I told myself is that as long as I didn't have to drink to get out of bed and perform whatever, if I don't have to get up and take a drink to get ready to go to work, then you're fine. You're not an alcoholic. Um, when people started catching on, I guess, um, at work, well, I don't know if it was, it, it wasn't truly towards the end, but um, where I work, we have a really great uh, vacation policy, and I had I worked there quite a while, so I had a number of vacation days. But I began to just use those because I couldn't come to work because I didn't feel well. Even though I could get out of bed, I just didn't feel well, and so I would have a stomach bug or a virus or the flu or whatever. Um, and depending on who was in charge that morning or that night, it was trickier the way I would have to work things and. I, I didn't really ever get called out on it, and as, when it first started, I was a little more mindful, and I, I didn't use the days um, like crazy, but I did spend a lot of my vacation time um, in bed for a little while, and then probably since I didn't have to work that day, I just got up and started drinking again because I was home for the day, so there's nothing else to do. Um, and then um, the pandemic. It. And I, I know there's, I've heard lots of talk about how that has changed lots and lots of things in lots and lots of ways. And it definitely did not help me to slow down drinking. Um, I was fortunate that I was able to go to work every day. Um, but we were obviously much slower at work. Um, a lot of our business went to online or pickup. Um, I still never drank. While I was at work, but work ended early. So if work ended at five, then we could be either if somewhere was open, we could be there at five to drink, or I could just go home and drink earlier. Um, and I created this formula in my mind about my drinking, how much I would drink. I had this idea that so if I started at this time, and now we're into Yeti cups, we've gone beyond Turbis Pumpers, <laughs> so now we're Yeti cups. <laughs> And there was a small Yeti cup, so I would have, you know, two, if I had two or three small Yeti cups with ice, and it was, I mean, it was all vodka and then a splash of whatever. Uh, and then I would switch and have one or two big, but, you know, that's just five drinks <laughs> in my mind. Um, and then if I went to bed by, say, ten, oh, you got this. I mean... I could, in my mind, sleep all of that off and be great the next day. Um, but people started, one person in particular uh, at work who um, I've known for a long time and would jokingly say that probably was not a joke. I just, he just, I guess, maybe didn't feel like he could be completely honest yet, but he would. He could smell the alcohol. And I never thought, in my mind, I was being so smart because I was drinking vodka. And I thought vodka doesn't smell. But it does. <laughs> and so I'm drinking lots and lots of vodka every night. And um, so it, you know, the rationalization that I made was just crazy. Um, so I've got my formula for drinking. 
if I had something going on, I would go do that, you know, for as little amount of time as I could, go to dinner, hurry through dinner, get home. Um, and I never really, it, I didn't really use my drinking to drink, like I wouldn't, most of the time my drinking was just I was drinking because that was what I was going to do. And then that made me start thinking about things. So I didn't like, something wouldn't happen and make me angry and then I would drink because of that. In my case it was more, I was just going to drink because I liked drinking. And then I would start thinking about things. I would think about, oh, well now that person didn't answer when I called. Or why hasn't that person done this? And then I would drink more and then I would get sad and just go off on tangents about just crazy things. Um, how I was at home alone and nobody would answer the phone at midnight <laughs> and while they were in bed like normal people. Um, and I was in a self-imposed isolation, which was then even crazier that I'm mad and sad and drinking because I'm alone, but I'm the one who's I've put me there and I've created this whole situation. So it's just this cycle that just I would drink and then I'd get sad and then drink and then it would just go on and on and on. Um, but I did, I, I then learned not to answer the phone really at all because people, close friends and probably even strangers, we're starting to tell what I sounded like when I was drinking. So I was, and, and certain would call me out on it, and then I would get mad, and then I would not answer the phone for them. Um, so I'm sitting alone almost every night in a messy loft. I, I have a wonderful place downtown, and for years, I would not let anyone in it because it was just a wreck and I would not put anything away. I would not do laundry. I would not do the dishes. And so it, it, that was so not me. Um, it's not me now. I can see in the past now, building up to that, how it was me because I was building up to who I was then. Um, but it's just, it was, a, it was a frightening situation to be in because I was making myself be alone and in this um, unsafe environment. Um, so that went all through the pandemic. Um, and then my health has been, you know, not great, definitely at the end of my drinking, but really I had health issues before that drinking were not good for. I just refused to think about it. Um, I had to have a kidney removed in college, so I only have one kidney, but I continue to drink. And, and friends who are in the medical profession would say, you know, I don't know if that's such a good idea. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I feel fine. <laughs> I bet the doctor hasn't said anything about it. So um, that kind of came to a head in, in 2022. Um, I was losing weight um, because I wasn't eating really at all. Um, I would um, I would drink it and I would order food and then I would either eat a little bit of it or throw it all away and then be mad at myself for ordering so much food. Um, and then I had these spots <laughs> on my face that, I, that were, it was just like a fever blister I think and I I just convinced myself it was something worse and I just messed with it and my immune system was so out of whack that it got just really, it got really bad. It looked bad. I mean, after seeing doctors, there was nothing bad about it except I had messed with it until it was infected. But I couldn't, I couldn't eat because it hurt to open my mouth. So I'm still drinking. My health is just cuckoo. I've got, I won't show my face in public. And I'm still not seeing that there's a problem. And I had friends who were saying, I don't think that, that didn't really look good. And I'm thinking, oh, well, it looks, you know, it was a little better than yesterday. So, and we're on, there was, I guess, the, the new variant of COVID. <laughs> so then I could wear a mask. And people were like, not freaking out about it. Um, or maybe they were, but I was, I felt better by hiding my face. So I'd rather hide my face than deal with that problem, which was scary. Um, and all the while I'm seeing 
I've seen my doctor because of my weight and my immune system is out of whack. How much are you drinking? Oh, one to two drinks a week. <laughs> um, and I finally, he sees, we talk about this, and because they give me some antibiotics, and, and it's not clearing up, but because it's close, it's on my face, and it's close to my brain, he wants me to go see um, another doctor to look at, like, all that, and they give me another antibiotic, so that begins to clear up, so I feel like I'm in the clear. Um, and then uh, the physical problem that probably got the catalyst for, I think, in my mind, people talking, I was having really, really, really bad shakes um, in my hands and even my legs, if I were sitting still or had my leg crossed. Um, because I, I think, in my mind, because I was not drinking in the morning or drinking throughout the day, by, the, you know, by lunch, by mid-afternoon, <coughs> I sometimes could not physically type on the computer. Um, and two um, good friends separately saw that when they were in the store. And, um, and it terrified me that someone close enough to me that might bring it back up saw something that I didn't want them to see. And so with one, I was just, I mean, I, was, I probably turned white and I just, made an excuse and left the floor and then she continued to text and check on me. Do you need to bring me something to eat? Are you okay? And I said, oh, no, no, I'm fine. I, think I, just, I just don't feel well. The other one um, was kind of the same way. I'm just shaking and I had that was in a probably August or September, maybe, and earlier that year, or earlier, a few, sometime recent to that, I had wrecked my car, and drinking was not involved, I don't know how that happened, but, so I just blamed that I was still real shaken up, you know, and she was like, didn't that happen like two months ago? And I'm like, yeah, but it just, she's like, well, maybe you need to see someone about that, if you're still shaken <laughs> because of that wreck, that doesn't matter. So I was like, okay, this lady is like a duck on a June bug, so she will <laughs> like she will hound me about this until until she figures out what the problem is. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to get through all of that, and then in October uh, of that year, I went to an engagement party for some friends that have been I've known since they were basically born. And I was putting on my suit that night, and it was, I mean, it was so, it just didn't fit. It was so big on me. I still had, this was still in my head bothering me, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get to the party and get a drink without shaking, because I would be at places sometimes, and I'd try to, I couldn't even pick up something with this. I'd have to calculate, okay, how am I going to slide my hand and hold the drink and then lift it up so that I it was just mentally exhausting. And I get to the party and I see a friend that uh, I now know is, is in, a, in the program. And um, I say something to this friend like, I, I feel like this suit doesn't look good. I feel like it looks big. I just don't feel, I feel out of sorts in it. And she said, oh, you, you look great. You look wonderful. But she's mentioned that night when we talked since I came into the program. Um, and she said, you know, that night I, I, had, I had suspicions that something was going on, but she said that night I just knew. Um, and so I, I made it through that, um, through that party. I got drinks in me, so then it was fine, and I was, I, I just wrote off, it was fine. I was, um, I was feeling great. Um, and I guess it was, so that was, October and then um, December is kind of when um, everything just kind of I guess came to a head. Um, I was um, calling in sick a lot. I had used all of my vacation days by the end of, or not even by the end of December, and that had never happened. I'd never used, and at that time I had like two and a half or three weeks of vacation and 
had used all of them. Um, and I remember a friend from work saying, um, we are worried about you. And I thought, my first thought was, well, there's nothing to worry about. You don't have to worry about me. And then I thought, why, who's sitting around talking about me? Who is we? Where's everyone been talking about me? And so I just kind of brushed it off again, and 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 I came back to work, and she never mentioned it. Um, but at this point, um, I guess there had been enough evidence, or people had seen enough of my shenanigans or my whatever, that different people were starting to, I think, kind of compare notes. And I was, I didn't do this on purpose. Um, but I have, I have lots of friends, but I have lots of friends who are in pretty specific groups. So there's like, you know, if there are four groups, there are friends who, I'll do something with this group, I'll do something with this group, and so on. And then there are a few that kind of weave it out. So they don't really mix all that often. And certainly not enough, I thought, to sit down and talk about me. But thankfully, what I couldn't say out loud at the time that I needed help, God was working um, in these friends to figure out what was going on with me. Um, and so um, that was Thanksgiving and Christmas of 2022. I didn't go home for Christmas. I had kind of stopped going home for holiday um, a long time ago. Just it was not it, it was just a different place, um, really. And then when I was drinking so much, I couldn't, thankfully, I would not drive an hour or an hour and a half home for holidays and drink and drive back. I was just, somehow, was not willing to do that, thankfully. Um, so I was always coming up with excuses as to why I wouldn't come home. I was sick. Um, I had car trouble. Um, I created this hysteria about hitting a deer to the point that I would get to, so I'm from outside of Batesville, I would get to like, um, sometimes like Tuckerman and just convince myself I was going to hit a deer and I'd pull over and call my family and say I'm not coming home. And then I would drive back and then I could drink. Um, so it was just insanity. Um, and when that happened, and people knew that I wasn't going home for holidays, they would ask me to come. And I could still, at that time, sort of come and treat people because I could go after having drinks and kind of be okay. Um, but when my friends sat down and really started talking, they were working on a plan kind of behind my back. Um, and someone found the facility, uh, found a treatment facility in Atlanta. Um, someone talked to my physician um, and then someone anyway they um, I went to I got asked to go to breakfast one morning and um, the two of my friends said um, we have found somewhere that you can get help would you be willing to go and at this point I've still never said to anyone I need help I don't I've never said I'm an alcoholic. I thought it several times. But I said, yes, I will go tomorrow. I will go whenever. And so um, so I went to the hospital here to be checked out. Um, and there, um, I was still trying to not be honest. And I was sitting with the doctor at, at the hospital. And they, I can't remember if it was the psychiatrist or just the mini doctor and one of them said how much do you drink? I said oh not that much like you know like a couple of drinks a week or something like that and my friend said Brandon tell the truth I still didn't really tell the truth I just found that fifth of my I drink a lot <laughs> I just hoping they would go away um, and so at that at that time in December, I was diagnosed with cirrhosis. Um, and I thought all of this time while I was drinking, you're drinking a lot. 
this this could be bad, but it, it, I, I just never connected the dots. Um, and I was diagnosed with some anxiety and some depression, some depressive disorder. And so they, I did my um, detox here in Jonesboro, just stayed with friends, um, and they started me on some medicine for um, anxiety and depression. I rang in my first sober new year that year. Um, also, behind the scenes, a friend was talking to uh, someone who would become my sponsor. Um, and, uh, Joe, I had known for years socially, um, would see at parties, and, and um, so I was very comfortable with him. Um, and so he was trying to get me to have coffee or, or whatever before. And I just, my fear was, I would go meet him, he would throw me in his car and bring me to a meeting. And I wasn't, it wasn't that I was scared of the meeting. I don't know what I was scared of. I just, I just kept saying, I'm, I don't think I'm ready for that. I don't think I'm ready for that. Um, and thankfully, he did convince me to come. And so before I even left for treatment, I came here to the shed. Uh, with Joe and said, my name is Brandon and I'm an alcoholic. And so I got a white chip here and met so many wonderful people just that first meet. I was scared and was very quiet. Um, so I left for treatment in Atlanta in January of that next year, 2023, um, and spent three months there. Um, went not really knowing how long I was going to be there. In my mind, maybe six weeks. Um, I was not opposed to being there longer, except I do way too much for lots of people. And I went with this calendar in my head of things that I had to do back in Jonesboro. And a friend said, no, give me that calendar. We'll take care of those things. <laughs> and so they recommended that I be there at least 10 weeks, if not 12 weeks. And, and I'm very fortunate with my employment that I was able to do that um, and just completely check out and be away. And I know now that I, for me, I had to get away. And it wasn't getting away from anyone else, it was getting, this doesn't really make sense, but getting away from myself because I put so much of myself into everything else but me, I had to get away to be able to work on myself. Um, so I started my step work at Talbot. Um, we had lectures, um, you know, 12 hours of lectures a week about how the brain works and how this disease works. Um, and I processed things. I had therapy while I was there. And I healed. I met wonderful friends that I talked to weekly, if not daily. Um, and um, I spent a lot of time on myself, which was wonderful. Um, I've always been a people pleaser. Um, and I've always sought my validation and approval of others um, in, in just everything I would do. Um, when I thought about my drinking time, um, all of those actions that I did, especially when I was drinking, they were unfulfilling, and a lot of things that I would do when I was drinking were not safe when I look back at that. Um, so I did see the value of taking time for myself, um, and thankfully the program I was in stressed the importance of AA. We went to local meetings while we were there, and it was wonderful. Um, and while I was there, um, some, some people, like Roy said earlier, had it differently. I don't have to, I can be as anonymous in my story as I want to be. And so I just, I decided for myself that if what I had been through could help other people, that I was willing to talk about it and share it wherever. Um, and um, so I'm thankful that I get to have that part of my journey as something that I can share with others. Um, in the, in um, the promises since I started the treatment and, and learned about the promises, my favorite has always been, we neither regret the past nor wish to close the door on it. 
Um, I've spent a lot of my life, um, and I guess ashamed is kind of a, a strong word, but I left college to get away from what I thought was a crazy family to find normal. <laughs> um, and I was glad, I can look back gladly and see that what I thought was normal, they probably thought was abnormal. I mean, there's just, normal is just not a true thing. Um, but I was, I was not proud of things I had done. Um, I hid things that I had done. Um, but now I get to see that promise um, and all the other promises come true. Um, and I've been allowed to grow through that. And, and I can say now that I'm grateful for my past because if I hadn't been through those, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, and I'm grateful for the shed. Um, when I left treatment, I took every word to heart. I, I'm, I'm always a student in things like this, and I want to be the best. So I wanted my first step to be the best, and I wanted my, this to be the best. And I had to get 90 minutes in 90 days. And um, I was told to get a sponsor, even if it was just a temporary sponsor, and work the steps. Um, and I was told that AA is a medicine that I'll need, just like any medicine that my physician would uh, prescribe to me. And I believed all of that. And I believed, when I got there, they said, just be open and willing to the program, the program of um, Alcoholics Anonymous, as well as the program of treatment that I was in, because some things are gonna sound silly, and some things are gonna sound like you're too cool to do that. But just, And I just took that to heart, and I was willing. I was tired of being not myself, and I was tired of um, being sick and tired. Um, and here, um, the people here have welcomed me from the beginning. I mean, from the moment I walked in here. And I did know a little bit about A. I think I asked my sister, because I can't remember anything. I asked my sister, and I think our daddy went to AA. I think I remember us dropping him somewhere and him coming back. It sounds like AA or treatment or something. Um, but we never talked about it, but I was aware of it. I just never thought I would be here. Um, but now I'm so thankful for the time I've spent here and the time that I will continue to spend here because this program helps me with my sobriety, but it also just helps me to be a better person. Um, and that's, you don't always get both of, both of what you need in one place. Um, and I had a, a good friend um, when I was involved at First Baptist Church, and he passed away recently. And he would, when he would leave somewhere, and I'm not leaving to go anywhere. I, after I wrote that, I thought, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> but he would say, he never said goodbye. He would just end whatever conversation or um, encounter, and he would say, take care of my friend, you matter to me. And that's what I was saying.